You join me today at the wheel of the European car of the year, 1981, Britain's best-selling car for almost a decade. And at one point, one of the cheapest cars you could buy when it was an absolute banger about 20 years ago. Yes, today I'm at the wheel of a 1985 1.3L Ford Escort Mark III. Proud to be sponsored by Diamond Bright, the car care products that have been keeping the furious fleet looking their best for a long time already. To find all you need to keep your car clean and protected, follow the link below to diamondbright.co.uk. So this is Britain's best-selling car for eight years. This, the humble Mark III Escort from 1980 until 1986. Okay, yeah, I know I just said eight years and that's only six years, but the Mark IV is basically the same car. So this, which looks so humble and normal and ordinary, but at the time was a breathtaking departure. Let's have a look around. So cast your mind back to the 1970s, even the late 60s, the Mark I and Mark II Escort were a very traditional three-box saloon. Rear-wheel drive, front-engined, and a proper good old-fashioned boot like your granddad had. But no, come 1976, when design work began on the Mark III Escort, the writing was on the wall for the three-box and the hatchback was here. So with a design team headed by Uwe Bunsen, following Ford's new design language from the continent with lots of clean, straight lines, gone with the curves, of course, and in was the hatchback and very definitely front wheel drive. Around the back, very obviously this is no longer a saloon, it was a hatchback. Oh, that goes up a long way, doesn't it? And this bit here, this little bustle back, known as the aero deck in Ford speak. Not only was this great for the consumer, giving them a huge boot in the back of the car, it was great for economy and also for company-wide fuel efficiency because it gave the car a drag coefficient of just 0.037, which is class leading at the time it was launched. And let's not forget these lights at the back. Look at the ridging on these things. Ridge lights were such a massive deal back in the early 80s and late 70s. Big fours like the Granada, Mercedes and the W123. Mercedes claimed the idea was that the ridges would create little air pockets and so they would stay clean enough for longer in bad weather. But in reality, everyone just thought they were really cool. Now here at the front of the car, the new Ford design language meant a couple of things. First of all, this more kind of integrated front end. Everything was wrapped around more. Gone were even the square headlights of the Mark II, which were still wrapped around by the grill. This is all separate units. It wasn't quite the full wraparound of the Sierra, which was coming later, but it was integrated into the bodywork. And also, sort of copying other Fords of the era, this black plastic louvred grille was very much Ford's corporate face of the early 80s. Being a Mark III, not a more stylish Mark IV, this has still got metal bumpers, although they are a three-piece bumper, so the wraparound plastic end does give you a bit of uh, cheapness if you have a minor collision and need to repair that. Now, the car we've got today is only a lowly 1.3L, so trim details are few and far between, and you'll see these wheels are standard steel wheels with not even a hubcap, just a little tiny dog dish in the centre. How basic is that? We'll see how basic it is on the inside as well in a minute. But at the time the car was launched, it was such a fresh thing. It's completely original and new. It was a massive sales hit as well, selling over 1.5 million before the car was discontinued at the end of its run. Now, inside the car, and it's a little tight getting in the front because it's a five door, the front doors aren't that long. Now, by modern standards, this doesn't feel massively spacious, but by comparison with cars of the era, it's actually rather good. Uh, so you've got decent headroom, the doors are extremely narrow and quite thin, so uh, you've got fairly good elbow room both sides as well. Now there are a few trim levels, being a Ford that always are, and this is an L, which is one up from the bottom, so you don't get a lot of goodies in the thing. Now people look at this with a modern eye and criticise it for being a bit haphazard and a bit square and edgy, but compared to the Mark II, this was again a big step along. So it was new and fresh and exciting in 1980. Now astonishingly for a company that's so hell-bent on cost-cutting, there were actually three different dashboard mouldings on this car depending on the trim level you got. There was an absolute base model one which didn't even have a centre speaker or centre air vents. Then there was a mid-range lower for L's and things which did come with a centre speaker grille and centre speakers but was unpleasantly hard plastic. And then there was the padded version for the top of the range. So for a car company trying to save pennies everywhere it could, that's a remarkably lavish level of moulding they've done. Now starting over on the door, as I mentioned it is ridiculously thin. I mean it is... It's that thick, it's as thick as my hand, no more. So I don't know what the crash protection would be like if something came in the side of the car. There's not a lot in it, uh, apart from the keep foot window, fairly obviously. 
uh, rather modern looking plastic door handle which doubles as the unlocker so there's no separate button or, or mechanism to waste pennies on there, just push the button down to lock it on the inside, pull the door handle to unlock it. You have the extravagance of a separate door handle and a huge door bin down the bottom so you can fit a lot of sweetie wrappers in there. The material is all just kind of a soft touch vinyl which has worn incredibly well it's got the elephant hide pattern on the top and the bottom in the center it's the same kind of perforated uh, pattern as you get in the ceiling of these things or virtually but in a far thicker material now looking up you have the luxury of an adjustable mirror an adjustable mirror don't get too carried away because the one on the left is the old-fashioned open the window and push it with your fingers model of uh, adjustability. Like, although that is fairly lavish because the popular, ironically named popular, didn't even come with a passenger mirror at all. Now we have the dashboard, which as I say was quite an advance in ergonomic styling and uh, the arrangement of controls and switches were quite a big thing. So starting over on the left, we have this large area, which I'm going to call my T-shelf because it is. This is the start of the modern day T-shelf. Things have moved on from the P6, which was cowled, older cars which had the pull-out wooden tray. This is a permanent plastic T-shelf, ideally placed for your travel cup of the modern era. It's lightly sloped, so things roll into the, uh, the dip away from you, and it's got a lip at the front. This is actually described as a tea shelf in some literature I read the other day. I don't know if maybe one of my videos had fallen through a wormhole and they'd read it back in the early 80s, but yes, this is the embryonic modern day tea shelf. This is where Rover R8s evolved from later on. Also, if you look in the glove box, there are two more smaller teacup holders, so you can have a proper Dagenham tea shelf party in here. I'm struggling to think what the traditional food of Dagenham would be. I'm going to say fish and chips and... I don't know, London Pride or a Carling or just a good old cup of tea. Cup of tea. Now this is not a base model, this is an L, so this speaker blanking plate is just a speaker blanking plate. The option was a basic radio and one speaker, which is just cruel. So much punishment, frankly. And this whole thing is just solid angles. There's a very slight curve to the top of it, but mostly it's just squared off and geometric solid shapes. And then your instrument binnacle in the center, very, very hard textured plastic. And it's got your dials in there, obviously. And like on a Mark II Granada, you have your heater controls vertically stacked to the left of the dials. Obviously, there's no large wooden panel with lots of auxiliary dials because we're talking basic entry-level motoring at this point. Speaking of which, when we get into the instrument binnacle itself, we've got two big dials on this car. One of them's a Speedo, and the other one is a massive clock because you didn't buy a rev counter on the L. You just got a clock, a fuel gauge, and a heater display. That's literally it, and some warning lights. You didn't even get warning lights for low fuel, low oil, that brake wear, that kind of stuff didn't come up to higher up in the range, which is an astonishingly basic thing you think could be on every car, but no, not on this. And over to the right of this big square box, we have another tiny, tiny little cubby hole. Uh, it's not very really big enough for anything. Um, coins maybe spare keys i don't know but moving down into the big flat face dashboard we have four because we're in an l um, air vents one on either side two in the center because we've paid for the lux version with the l and directly in front of us we have our steering wheel which is very thin rimmed it's kind of not quite hard plastic not quite hard rubber i'm going to go with hard plastic of the two though because it's pretty tough when this center pad you, you don't want to bang onto that with your face in a crash. You will definitely want to be wearing a seatbelt in this car because that is the hardest plastic I think I've ever felt. So yeah, airbag, soft touch, forget all that malarkey. This is uh, hard stuff, we die like men and all that. Now between the steering wheel and the instruments, we've got our stalks. On the left-hand side, we've got our main beam headlight, indicators and the horn, time for a horn test. <laughs> Yeah, that's an appropriate level of hootiness for this car, I approve. On the right hand side, we've got two stalks, unusually. At the back, furthest away from us, we've got a two-stage clicker lifting up on this very spindly little stalk um, for the side lights and headlights. And in front of that, we've got our windscreen wipers. Two stages of speed coming up and push down for a flick wipe. I was gonna say that was the rear screen, but it's the wrong pictogram. Now, both the indicator and the wipers have got a function if you push the end, the horn and the washers. But the light stalk doesn't. But they've in imitated that same pattern with a little plastic moulded in groove that looks like there could be something, but there isn't. 
but they're all so spindly and tiny. We forget how small controls used to be in cars. Now below and behind all this, we've got some more hidden switches, hidden in a really annoying way for some fairly basic controls. Now to the right, we've got two switches, or one blanking plate and a switch hidden by these controls. One is, does nothing, puts a blanking plate, and the other is the rear screen heater. Over to the left, it's a little bit more visible. We've got another blanking plate with our rear fog lights because rear fog lights were the law, otherwise they wouldn't have given you one. And then finally, this weird round contraption. It's looking very out of place in the car from 1985. This is the choke. This is probably the last ever vestige of a choke you'll see on a Ford car because by this point the automatic choke had come in and was proving very unpopular because it wasn't particularly uh, efficient or reliable in those early days. But yes, yeah, so this one still has the good old-fashioned manual pulley outy choke. Now in the center this did have a radio as standard. Now the L did get a radio. This has lost its original one but has now got a fantastic period correct sharp aftermarket one which has got not only a cassette player, it's got auto reverse and it's got a graphic equalizer oh my word this thing is so cool Oop, copyright music um, <laughs> now because this is super duper posh this has got four loud speakers and you can tell it's got four loud speakers partly by looking at the car and seeing four loud speakers two of the front ones or the two front ones are down here in pods in the foot wells which is a ridiculous place and it does eat into your foot real estate quite significantly uh, in this kind of same blue as the uh, door cards in the carpet um, but also you've got this faded thingy down here by these uh, pop out tape holders wow that it launches the tape into your hand or your face that's so violent be careful with that that could hurt yourself have, have someone's arm off with that um, so yeah, you've got the pointless fader which I always say every time I review one of these I say it was was pointless and ridiculous and just introduced crackles and I get comments from people saying oh but they were great I remember them yeah I remember them too I was there as well they were rubbish in the 80s, they were rubbish in the 90s, they're still rubbish in the 2020s. Nothing's changed, it's just a gimmick. Oh, dear me. <laughs> now we have more T-shelfery above our fader and dangerous cassette holders. We've got a great big tray, which is big enough for a modern day iPhone 10 or something. It's, it's huge. And yet more shelfery over here under the steering wheel. It's kind of like a document shelf, it's huge. You lose an army of gerbils in there. Why you'd have an army of gerbils, I don't know. Each their own. And then we have the gearbox. Initially, there wasn't an automatic option. It wasn't until later on the three speed, or oh, count the luxury of three speed automatic, was introduced, which is actually taken from the American derived Escort, which was not the same car, but it was closely ish related. This, though, has a four speed manual. A five speed was available as an option or standard on the 1.6. However, this is a 1.3, so we get four whole forward speeds and we have the luxury of reverse as well. Right, let's have a look in the back. Now in the back, we've got the same hard wearing tweed fabric, which is tough and slightly itchy, a bit of a hair shirt of an interior. I think I've got a cloth cap in the same material somewhere. It's lovely in a hat, but in the interior, it's just rough enough to remind you, you should have paid slightly more for the better interior. Now this car has only got 44,000 miles on it, so it does have a perfect condition interior, so it hasn't even had to work hard at surviving. Uh, one thing you do get in the L, because unlike the ironically named Popular, which is popular with no one apart from fleet managers, this has got headrests in the front. So my view of the front is slightly obscured. However, we've got no headrests in the rear. We haven't even got seatbelts in the back because seatbelts didn't become mandatory until about a year after this car was built. This rear seat though does actually fold down. It's a 60-40 split, which was still a big deal back in 1980. In fact, the entire early 80s, folding seats in the hatchback was still a big deal. Now we've got very little else in the way of equipment. We've got keep fit windows, same as in the front. And these do actually go all the way down to the bottom, which is exciting because it's got rear quarter lights, which is a exiting feature for our cars in those days. Now this is the big deal in this car, the boot. It is a hatchback. Exciting stuff from the early 80s. Now, one thing that's also kind of weird, I thought these were aftermarket speakers that someone had stuck in or hacked about the rear parcel shelf. But if you look underneath it, there's plastic molding. These are genuine factory speakers that were just stuck in this cardboard shelf. The sound quality must have been appalling. Now, inside the boot, you've got a lot of space for a relatively small car. It's absolutely massive in here. This car has lost its uh, carpet at some point in its history, but you can see from that how well the car has survived. It's a decent space. This load dip is very high, which means if you're trying to load awkward, struggling things in, it is quite hard. But it does mean things can't get out again very easily as well. Obviously, things like shopping that won't roll out. If oranges, a bag of oranges won't roll out. Not a struggling victim. <clears throat> right, so look at the engine, then we'll take it for a drive. Oh yeah. 
I don't know if this is intended as a handle or not, but there's a little cutout with a little bit of plastic stuff to stop the sharp edges of the pressed metal slicing your fingers off. You do get greasy fingers in the mechanism though, but you can use it as a handle. I don't know if that's intended or not. Now, one thing that's always bugged me about Fords of this era is the bonnet release. It's a huge orange tag right under the center of the steering column where you might expect to find, I don't know, the steering adjustment. So, and I know you shouldn't be adjusting steering wheels when you're driving the car, but occasionally you do want to just tweak it a bit and it's quite natural to just reach under the steering column, pull the handle and move the steering wheel around. Of course, if you try that in one of these, the bonnet flies open in your face. So not great design. Now, other than that, this is a good car. <laughs> now, under the bonnet, we will find on this particular car, Ford's all new overhead cam CVH 1.3. This was an exciting new development which made all of 68 horsepower and I think 74 foot-pound of torque or pound-feet of torque. There was also a 1.1 litre Valencia Kent-based engine which I cannot imagine how slow that car would be making around 50 horsepower. The biggest option in this car was the 1.6 which was significantly quicker. Well, I say significant, it was a bit quicker. It was, it was a lot quicker in the XR3. But yes, this is an engine. It may not look like much, but the big thing here is the way it's mounted, it's transverse, which is the first time in an Escort. This is only Ford's second ever European front wheel drive car after the uh, Fiesta in 78. So having the engine facing this way, powering these wheels, is actually quite a big deal. Of course, you can also see the gearbox without having to jack the car up as well. Again, a first, it's here on the end of the engine, which is pointing that way now. That's exciting, so we're gonna take it for a drive now and see what we think of it. Squeaky fan. Right, let's take this thing for a drive. Wow, this takes me back. I had a number of Mark III and IV Escorts back in the 90s, starting with an utterly horrible orange 1.3L, the same spec as this car. I have zero fond memories of it. Then I had a, a Laser, which is a very late Mark III, and a Mark IV, which is the most I ever spent on an Escort, which I think was a thousand pounds. So yeah, this was austerity motoring at its finest back in, well, the uh, early 80s and very, very austerity in the 90s when I finally got my hands on it. Now this particular car is a 1.3L from 1985. It's a fairly late one, but the spec hadn't really changed and certainly hadn't improved. It's a basic car for people who just wanted basic transport and that's kind of what they got. In 1981, this was the European car of the year. It fought off such greats as the Metro, with its innovative design, useful features, and lots of space. Now, when it was first launched, it did get a lot of criticism for the handling because the, uh, the cast and camber of the front and rear wheels were kind of going the wrong way, which did give it some slightly rough handling and skittish ride. In 83, 84, they uh, updated that with the uh, new suspension mounting points from the uh, Orion and that massively improved things. And being a later car, this is a lot better. It is independent suspension all round, a massive step on from the Mark II with its leaf sprung rear. This is uh, McPherson's struts at the front, trailing arms at the rear, all coils. Disc brakes at the front, drums at the back. No ABS, obviously, no power steering, but it's a very light car. It's about 850 kilos, I think, so you don't really need it. However, with only 68 or so horsepower on tap, a steep hill does mean you want to be shifting down from top, which is fourth, down to third. And the brakes are respectable, but coming down from 40 to 30 on a hill, you need that downshift to help stop the car as well. <laughs> oh my gosh, ducks! Ducks! We're being waddled at. There is waddling happening. There's extreme waddling occurring in front of the car. Now, being a Ford, there were lots of trim levels on this thing. Obviously, the most basic one was the Popular, which was astonishingly Spartan. No headrests, no passenger mirror. Oh, you're lucky to get wheels on the thing. Next up was the L. This one was a very popular model because you got just enough luxuries to make it feel comfortable. Radio headrests, that kind of thing. So you didn't feel like you're living in poverty, but it was a cheap car. Then you got things like the GL, the Gear, and of course the XR3, which was available from the very beginning on this thing. There was fast motoring at the outset. And 
there's a car for everyone as well. Uh, the uh, three-door and the five-door hatchbacks, obviously. And then you had the three-door estate version, and a year later the five-door estate version. And then there was a van as well, and of course the convertible. There was everything. There was a car literally for everyone. So no matter what level of power, what level of trim, what body style you wanted, there was a car that would fit your, your budget and your needs. Fords really were a car for everyone. This hill looks quite steep, so I'm going to drop all the way to second. Can't tell you what I'm revving to, because I'm revving to 236, I believe, at the moment. Or 237. That's a lot of revs. It's past my dinner time. That many revs. And that hit us to 40 miles an hour. So, yeah. Now, as I said, the suspension is improved on the early ones. It's still a little bit bouncy. As we go over these little bumps and undulations, the car does kind of lift on its springs quite happily. But a joyful little thing. It does roll pretty hard into corners, though. The XR models were much improved with their lower suspension. This, though, was just, uh, well, not so good. You really do notice the, the lack of the, uh, the higher gear because fourth is just a little bit too thrashy for anything over 40 miles an hour. Oh, steep hill again. Now, this was a clean sheet in 1980, obviously it's from the mid 70s when they started designing the thing. And that meant they kept on with it. So when the car was updated into the Mark IV, it was still the same car, just with curvier bodywork. Nothing really changed. Although the interior did feel an awful lot nicer. Wow, look at this thing Whoa! nearly fall over. That's, you almost that's, drifted there. That's a frightened Mr. Lloyd in the back of the car. That was excitement at a um, massive 40 miles an hour. <laughs> Mr. Lloyd's uh, explosion just there was perhaps a little unfounded as the car wasn't actually going to fall over. Now, the way the car does roll, the way the car rolls even at 20 miles an hour does make it feel like you're always going quite quickly even though you're not. Because going quickly is something you very rarely do in one of these cars. I mean, I have pushed these things as hard as they will go on the motorway. And it, it will do it, but it's not a comfortable experience. It'll get you up to license losing speeds. But you'll lose your patience and your sanity before you lose your license. Now, back in the uh, 90s, when they were advertising ABS, there was a Ford advert, which I think it was, must have been a high spec Sierra, trying to get, well, experiencing a sudden tractor. This is not a situation you'd find yourself in with this car. At 40 miles an hour, you'd still be modulating your foot and hoping not to go in the back of the thing. And that trundling tractor was just about the limit of this car's overtaking abilities. Now, it's interesting this car is still called the Escort because it nearly wasn't. I was going for fifth gear then, it wasn't a fifth gear. Originally, it was going to be called the Erica, but there was objections from two sides of the channel from that one. In England, the Escort name was just too fondly remembered uh, for people to break away from it, so they couldn't really step away. It wasn't until the Mark V and VI were really such poor cars, they had to kind of make a clean break and go with the Focus, they finally killed the Escort name. And in Germany, Erica, apparently, I've not heard it myself, Oh, straight into Compton. Um, Erica was a, a popular marching song from the Second World War and some, you know, obviously unpleasant connotations only 30 years after the end of the war. So uh, that got knocked on the head for that reason as well. So escort it is. Now, these things were also a hit with the salesman because you could load these cars up with so many options. Tilt slides, sunroofs, central locking, alloy wheels, body kits, all kinds of stuff to bump the price of your Mark III Escort a little bit more in favour of the salesman's commission. Of course, not all of them got much at all. This one's got basic wheels, not even hubcaps on this car. So whoever specced this car was clearly saving a few pennies. Did you see that? Around 1916, Valve go past. Wow. 
and the visibility out of these cars is just astonishing because these A and B posts are just spindly thin. You can see absolutely everything around you. And uh, looking into the rear of the car, we've not only got the quarter lights in the back of the door, we've got additional windows in the C posts. And not to 60 time on this car, was about 11.9 seconds. And the top speed apparently on the 1.3 is 98 miles an hour officially. The speedo reads to over 100. It goes to 140 on the dial, because they had the one for all the cars. And uh, it is woefully inaccurate by the time you got to the top. And if you did hit 98, it reckoned you were doing over 100. But there is, although it's a very basic, kind of, as I say, austere car, there is a likable, just dependability about the thing. It makes you feel welcome. It's like you're in a, an old friend when you get into an Escort. Comfortable seats, well-placed um, instruments, well-placed uh, controls. It's like coming home in, any, in a way, even if you've never driven one before. It still just feels just natural. And there's something about an Escort that you've seen so many of them on the street, on people's drives. You've had an aunt, an uncle, a grandparent had one. It's just part of your life. It's the background of society. It's street furniture almost. It's kind of a shame you don't see Mark 3s and 4s around anymore. It's almost funny to me now not to see them anymore, if that makes sense. The gearbox, although it's only a four speed, is nice to use. It's very light, it's a little bit notchy, but not as notchy as a lot of things. It just kind of drifts into gear without any hassle. It's a nice little gearbox, really. So everything on the car is easy to use. The pedals aren't too heavy. The clutch is quite a long throw and the biting point's fairly high up, but it's uh, not a difficult thing. That may be because it's on its original clutch. It's only got 44,000 miles on it, but I'm guessing that's never been changed. Now, I've not done a 0 to 60 on this car yet. Now, because it's not particularly powerful, I'm gonna give it the benefit of the doubt and do it downhill. Are we ready? Three, two, one, go. 20, 30, 40, 45, 50, 53, 55. Okay, gave up on 60 before the corner came. <laughs> I'm not calling this car rapid, but it is a lot of fun. The thing about a bouncy, jouncy old car like this, you get it onto a back road, you don't have to go horrifically quickly for it to come alive, really. You're pushing it to kind of the end of its uh, handling envelope at 40 miles an hour, and so it's quite entertaining, even at low speeds. The thing is though, you really do notice the NVH, noise, vibration, harshness. Uh, the sound deadening I'm guessing on this car is minimal at best, because it is quite loud. The road noise is intrusive, the engine noise is intrusive, a lot of rumble, not much wind noise, interestingly. Any okay, real, intrusion in terms of wind is the fan which squeaks like crazy. Well thank you for joining me today. I hope you've enjoyed this ride out in this rather nice Survivor Mark III Escort. If you have, please hit like and subscribe, smash those buttons and all the obligatory YouTube stuff. And I'll see you again next time driving something completely different.